morning, everybody. Can you hear me loud and clear? Before you sit. So let's be standing. You know, I was taught when I was growing up that you don't sit until you are told to sit. <laughs> but now, I guess now the culture has changed. You sit before you are told. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Come Lord Jesus Committee for inviting us year after year to this wonderful conference, this wonderful country. I hope you don't get bored of us coming year after year. No? No, really? Oh, all right. Surely our God is a good God. Amen. Amen. Let's bow heads for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ this morning. We have come, O oh Lord our God, to this conference as it was spoken of Queen Esther. For such a time as this, she has come into the kingdom. In like manner, for such a time as this, in the momentous history of this nation, you have gathered your children together for a historical meeting. Now we pray, Lord, that you will make your voice heard to all these, your sons and daughters who are gathered here. Not only to this, but also to those who are afar off that hearing they will give heed to what the Spirit of God is going to speak to the church in Australia in these last days. And we also pray that the four winds in this nation will carry these words into the four corners of this nation that this nation may hear the trumpet sound of the Lord God that is blowing in this nation during these days of this conference. And we pray that all the angels whom you have appointed to be stationed in this conference to hear what God will speak to the churches. As the angels stood before the Apostle John to hear what he will write to the seven churches in like manner these who have been appointed over the provinces of this nation let them hear and bring forth to the churches all over this nation the things that God will speak the things that God will reveal through his prophets his servants during this conference, Lord. We also pray that the scrolls that will be written during these meetings will also be carried to your choice servants, the godly ones in this nation, to whom it is already appointed, will receive them and make themselves ready for a visitation from you. And now I pray for all these your saints who are gathered here. Lay your blessing hands upon them, Lord. Lay your blessing hands upon each and every one of them. And give them a peace beyond all understanding. And give them a heart, an understanding heart, and a listening ear that they may hear 
what the spirit of God is going to speak to them during this conference. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Once again, greetings to every one of you in the name of our dear Lord Jesus. And also, uh, a big thank you to the committee who invited not only me, but also the other speakers, Reverend Neville Johnson and Dr. Bruce Allen. So we thank you. And we also thank you for your great love for us that you have extended to us. And I'm sure you all are praying for us, aren't you? No? Yeah. You. <laughs> you know, they say it is common science and common sense. If you want to eat fruits from a tree, you must take good care of the tree. Right? So if you don't take good care of the tree, you can't eat the fruit. In the same way, to eat the fruit that comes forth from our ministries, the tree must be taken good care of. So you are the gardener to take care of the tree. Amen? So you all are gardeners. Now, this is the first session of the conference. And I'm given the good task of starting this conference. You know, if you read the Holy Bible very carefully, especially the books of the minor prophets, from the book of Daniel right up to the book of Malachi, they are called minor prophets not because they are of any lesser importance, but because the messages that they give are very short, just like me, short. <laughs> My other respected men of God are much taller. So, short messages, but if you read them, they will scare the daylights out of you. <laughs> because from the book of Jose, right up to the book of Malachi, you don't find any good messages there. You'll only find words of warning and words of admonition. But you'll also find promises spice here and there all throughout their books. Those promises of good blessings from God are in answer to repentance or to a nation turning around to the living God. So that was their task. And every prophet who ever appeared in the history of Israel You'll always find them bringing words of warning, words of admonition to stir a nation back to righteousness so that it will be in right standing with God. You know, among all the prophets in the Bible, the one that most people like the most is Isaiah because the entire book of Isaiah is full of loving, kind words, full of words of encouragement, full of words of consolation. However, if you read them very carefully, especially the first 30 chapters or first 40 chapters, they too are full of warnings, full of admonition. So likewise, I bring you So by, by now you should know what I'm going to speak. You know, yesterday at about 11.30 at night, as I was waiting on God, when I bowed my knees to pray, 
I saw the Lord Jesus appear in my room and this was what he spoke. And I'm going to quote to you as exactly as how I receive it from the Lord. Tell them that I will visit them with an iron hand to judge and punish if the nation votes for same-sex marriage bill. Now I know that you are at a crossroad, right? In fact, you are in a balance. You can tip for righteousness or you can tip for unrighteousness. You can tip either way, you can swing either way. That's where you are right now, at a crossroads. And I have read something about that, what the plebiscite that you are going to go for, but I've never paid much attention or delved deeply into what exactly is the issues in this nation. But this is what the Lord said. Tell them, I will visit them with an iron hand to judge and punish if the nation votes for same-sex marriage bill. So which means it's not just the voting, it's the result of the vote. If a large majority has voted for saying yes, then it becomes a law, right? Your parliament will pass a bill saying now same-sex marriage act is approved. And not only the secular justices or marriage registrars are anxiously waiting to conduct same-sex marriage. There are some churches who are also very anxiously waiting to be the first person to conduct or marry a same-sex partner. See, that is a worse disgusting act that can be conducted or done in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, when a minister conducts a wedding, the couple stands before him, he stands by the pulpit, and in the name of the triune God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, he's going to pronounce them man and wife. That's what they usually do, right? Now, instead of a man and a wife, there's going to be a man and a man, and a woman and a woman. So he's going to stand here and say, in the name of the triune God, I now bless you, men and men. Or woman and woman. That's what he's going to do. And in the name of the Lord. So you are going to take the name of the Lord in vain. And you are going to pronounce a benediction. The blessings or the word of blessings that will come out of the lips of a minister. It will be words of blessings. If you read Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 24, the Lord God through the prophet Moses gave a command to Aaron how he should bless the children of Israel. And the command was, as soon as Aaron speaks those words, those blessings will come upon the children of Israel. So that is the vested authority on the priest. Because of the anointing that is upon his life, when he speaks a word of blessings, the word of blessings comes out of his mouth as the Lord will bless a couple. So here you have 
a gay hearted priest see a, a minister may not be a gay externally but if you approve such a thing you are a gay in your heart you are not a gay externally you may you may be a good husband with a good wife but for you to say yes for you to say it's okay this is okay this is just an alternate lifestyle if you say that your heart is a gay heart your mind is a gay mind so as he thinketh in his heart so is he so as you think in your heart then you become a gay you may not be physically but in the eyes of god when he looks at you he sees you as a gay person you know when the lord jesus christ was so explicit to say if a man looks at a woman and lusts after her in his heart this it's not just looking because when you walk past by you are always looking even when i stand here i'm looking <laughs> looking is not the problem is what happens after the looking what is the result of the looking when you lust in your heart you are an adulterer you may not have done it in the flesh you don't need to commit adultery in the flesh you have already committed adultery in your heart in the same manner when you lift up your hand to say yes and amen to vote for same sex marriage or gay rights then you have become a gay in your heart and your mind now why did god destroy sodom and gomorrah among the many nations that have existed in the face of this world the most famous nations for gays we as we all know is sodom and gomorrah another word for homosexual people is a sodomite or the the act of homosexuality is also called sodomy now where do we get all those words from right from the twin cities of sodom and gomorrah so why did god destroy sodom and gomorrah if you read genesis chapter 18 verse 20 the lord god said and the lord said because the outcry against sodom and gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grave the cries that came from the land was very great and grievous in the years of the lord now that's what god said now when the two angels that were sent to spy out sodom and gomorrah when they came into the land now this is what they said for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the lord and the lord has sent us to destroy it the land has been crying out to god because of the grief grief and great sins in the land now besides a a gay man having relationship with another gay man or a lesbian woman having relationship with another lesbian woman what is so great or so grievous about sodom and gomorrah is that innocent people were brutally raped see if you look into genesis chapter 19 very carefully you will find that not 
every single person in Sodom and Gomorrah were a gay. There were some straight people. There were some innocent people. A good example is the family of Lot. We know that Lot was a honest, God-fearing man. So was his wife. Not only that, he had two virgin daughters. So they were unspotted. They kept themselves clean from all the sexual defilement in the land. So just like them, there were many, many innocent people in Sodom and Gomorrah who were brutally molested, brutally raped, and brutally taken advantage of. Now this was a revelation from the Lord. But when I was looking to the scriptures in different translations of the Bible, I was very surprised to find that it is also written in the scriptures like that. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 and 21, in the, the message translation of the Bible, it says like this, God continued, the cries of the victims in Sodom and Gomorrah are deafening. The sin of those cities is immense. I am going down to see for myself. See if what they are doing is as bad as it sounds. Then I'll know. Now look at the first sentence. It says, the cries of the victims. If they are all consenting partners, they will not be victims. Everybody agrees? To be a victim, you are not a consenting partner. So your rights are violated. Your physical body is violated. So they were not only committing fornication among themselves, they were also brutally abusing the innocent. They were brutally raping, molesting, even killing. You know, today, it is very common to read that when a young girl is raped, many a times she's also killed. Do you have that problem in your country? We have that in India. I used to wonder, why do these rapists kill these young girls? No, they have already raped this girl. At least they could have just Leave them alone. And as I pondered, this is the thought that came to my mind. I may be right, I may be wrong. This is not a revelation. This is just my assumption. Could it be that these girls or these innocent ones are killed so that they will not report or testify against their rapists? A rapist wants to escape the law. So, to kill their victim is to silence the evidence. And now look at the attitudes of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis chapter 13 verse 13 says, But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So not only were they wicked, they were also sinful. Now I would like you to also take note of all these, all these pointers that I'm sharing with you and to check it against the society in Australia. You want to check and see if there is a parallelism between what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah to what is happening in Australia. You want to check them. If they all tellies, or a majority of them tellies, then you will know what is your fate as it came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So they were very, very filthy and wicked. What does that mean? They were, men was fornicating against men. Now that we know it's called in our language today, homosexuality. 
not only that do you want me, do you want me to be very candid and real or do you want me to just hide something so so as to appear politically correct <laughs> do you want me to lay it as it is yes. all right now i am going to share with you very candidly what god showed me last night about the situation in sodom and gomorrah why they were so wicked and evil in the sight of god so much so that he had to destroy that entire people group they were fornicating man with man and woman with woman and the gross sin you know i'm i'm very very hesitating to share with you because it is really really gross i not only heard this from the lord but in a vision i saw last night this ax that the people in sodom and gomorrah did it is too gross to even say it in public they were eating and drinking the male semen and offered them as a drink offering to demons you know this is something which is very very true even in modern world today that the male seed and the female seed are important ingredients in demon worship they are offered as a sacrifice to get powers from the demons and many many god men of various other religions they became god men with various powers because of this act that they do most of them you'll find are always single see it is forbidden for them to have a normal family life and then they offer their male seed as an offering unto these gods see there is life in the male seed and there's life in the female seed so you are taking that life and you are offering it it is like offering a baby as a sacrifice the only difference in this case is that which comes out of the male body or female body without mixing together with a male ovu a male sperm and a female ovu it remains pure on its own so that which is offered as a sacrifice to these demons are an undiluted unadulterated sacrifice so it's a pure sacrifice of high power and that results in the god men being endowed with powers from the evil one you know when my when my father was a hindu priest i remember i was very small at that time i used i used to remember seeing him that when he came back home after his work he had a normal job as a mailman and all his spare time he devoted himself as a priest he prayed very ardently every day for several hours every night from about 7 in the evening right up to about 12 or 1 or 2 in the morning i see him stand before this box of our altar and before the idols and he'll just chant the prayers over and over again for hours then after about 40 days he received what i would call today the baptism of the evil spirits just like we received the baptism of the holy spirit he received the baptism of the evil spirits and the spirits came upon him and endowed him with the gift of prophecy with the gift of healings and the gift of working miracles and i was an eyewitness to all this you now when demon possess people 
those Hindus, those Muslims and the Buddhists, they come, he will just lay his hands and cast those demons out. And when they are sick, they come to him, he lays his hands under the inspiration of those evil spirits and they are healed. And when they come with a problem to seek an answer from God, like seeking after a medium, he'll go into this trance and then speaks in strange language, like how we would speak in unknown tongues, and then he gives them a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. I have seen this with all my eyes. Let me give you one very good example. When I was 12 years old, I prayed to the gods in our home. I prayed that if I pass in my exams, I would fulfill a vow. I made a vow to the gods. Now, when I made a vow, no one in our house knew about it. I never told anybody my vow. It was just between me and my God. And after I passed my exams in flying colors, like all of us do today, we make our vows to our, the living God after, the, after God blesses us. Most of us always do one thing. We forget to keep our vows. Amen, everybody? <laughs> See, you all are wonderful, honest Christians. <laughs> so, I forgot my vow. A few months later, one day, while there was a ceremony in our house, the spirits came upon my father and he was ministering to so many people and I was his assistant priest. <laughs> See, you have assistant pastor, there is also an assistant priest. Every priest has an assistant. They don't do all the job by themselves. So, I was his assistant and suddenly, you see, now he's under the full anointing of the evil spirits. He just turned to me and pointed a finger at me and revealed the vow that I made. Now that is, that is what we would call a gift of the word of knowledge. He revealed the vow and threatened me with dire consequences if I don't keep the vow. So what would you do naturally? Out of fear, you want to keep the vow. Why Christians don't keep their vows? Because the living good God doesn't threaten you with dire consequences. <laughs> Isn't it? So, now, the point is this. When my father was being endowed with these powers and gifts from the evil one, they demanded a sacrifice from him in return for the powers that were given to him. So on the day that he was baptized, every year he was required to offer <coughs> blood sacrifice. So I remember the very first time that he went to offer the blood sacrifice. At 12 midnight, he went to a cemetery and this is what he said. He took, he folded up his sleeves, took a long knife and cut his hand from the wrist up to the elbow. A, a big cut and blood came out of his hand and he said to his great shock, not a single drop of blood fell to the ground. They would come out of his hand and then they all disappear in mid-air. I'm sure I've heard of blood-sucking demons. He saw with his own eyes, which proved them to be very real. So they drink blood, not only blood, but also this male seed and female seed. Now, these same acts were also done by the false prophets under Jezebel. If you read 1 Kings chapter 16, Verses 31 to 33 and chapter 18, verse 19. There were 850 false prophets under Jezebel. And among the 850, 450 of them were prophets of Baal. 
Now it is Baal who demands such kinds of sacrifices. Baal demands human sacrifice and Baal demands these kinds of sexual unclean sexual acts as sacrifices. So there were temple prostitutes and there were gay priests. So these were all acts were done during the time of Sodom and Gomorrah and also done by the priests under Jezebel. And when you read 1 Kings chapter 18, after the showdown that the prophet Elijah had with the false prophets, among the 850 of them, he only killed 450 prophets of Baal. He did not kill the other, uh, sorry, 450. He did not kill the other 400 false prophets. Why? Only Elijah knows the answer. But he only killed 450 prophets of Baal because, I guess, they were the worse than the others. Because they are the ones who promoted lewd, unclean, demonic practices all over the land of Israel. Now, as, as the Lord gave me this message, I remembered about a vision that I saw last year about this time during the conference. So I checked my notes and I looked at this vision that I saw. In this vision, I saw a scene that was taking place in heaven. You know, you read in Daniel chapter 7 that the books were opened and the court in heaven was set. And then in Revelation chapter 20, you will read the books were open and the court was set. And in Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 18, you will read that a council in heaven was set and the deliberations were made concerning affairs of the nations. And in Amos chapter 3 verse 7, you will read that in the council, the prophets are gathered there and God reveals his secrets to the prophets. And before he does anything, he first shares with his prophets what he's going to do. In the same manner, I saw in this vision the council in heaven and they were discussing about the situation in Australia, very particularly Sydney. So among the many representations that were made, I saw two angels who were called to testify in the council. And this is what they said. Those two angels, when I saw them, they were identified as the very two angels that were sent to spy Sodom and Gomorrah. So they stood there and this is what they said. When we visited Sodom and Gomorrah, only men were engaged in gross sexual acts. But here, meaning this nation, it is woman with woman, mankind with animals, parents with children, and some grandparents with their grandchildren. These parents engage in sexual perversions with their children as if they were husbands and wives. See, that's the report that's been submitted in heaven. That's their findings. When they went out all over the city, all over the nation, and they saw what was being done. The things that were done publicly and the things that were done in the secret. See, don't ever think just because you are within close doors, close environments, no one sees you. A human being may not see you. A human eye may not see what your left hand is doing and your right hand is doing. Human eye will not see. But the eyes of God that goes out all over the world, 
it sees everything. Now, when I was flying from Singapore to Australia, I was in the airplane sitting there, and it is my custom always to pray as soon as I sit down and buckle the seat belt. I always pray committing the plane into the hands of God and for the journey that I was going to go. And I was startled to see an angelic being that I recognize <clears throat> to be one of the four living creatures found in the book of Revelation chapter 4. And this being that I saw was like a lion. Its head right up to its chest was very manly like a lion. And from the chest downwards, it was like a man. And there were four wings all stretched out. And there were eyes all over his wings and all over his body. So when I saw this angel, I asked him, Who are you? Although I know, I mean reading from the Bible, who this person was. The reason for my question is this, because there are many, many unexplainable things in heaven that are not found written in the Bible. Whatever is in the Bible are samples of many, many, many other things that are not written. So you don't want to assume this is that. So always have an open heart, open mind to the many, many mysteries that are in heaven that God will be gracious and kind to teach us. So when I saw this being, he, when I, after I asked him this question, he looked at me and he said, don't you recognize me? I said, of course I do, because I've seen you several times. You have, you have appeared before me many times. So then I ask, but what are your functions? We don't read much about that. So he said, we are God's angels. So I, when he said God's angels, so I asked him, what is the difference between this statement from the rest of all the angels that are there? They are also God's angels. So he said, there is a difference. The rest of the angels... They are your angels created for mankind. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, it says, The angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to the heirs of salvation. Right? So they are your angels. But these living creatures, they are God's personal. In the sense that they have eyes all over, they are the eyes of God that goes out everywhere. See, this is quite similar to the drones that are used by the army. You know, before the army sends out a, uh, a, a fighting troop, first they send out a drone with cameras in the plane to spy out what is on ground zero. So the drone takes pictures and it sends to the headquarters and the headquarters sees everything down. In the same manner, these living creatures and the cherubims with all eyes all over their body, you know, with our two eyes, we only can see in one direction at one time. You cannot see what's behind your head. But this cherubim, these living creatures, they have eyes all over their head all over their wings, all over them, they can see in all 360 degrees at the same time. So all information is processed at the same time, like just like how we see in one direction at one time. So that's what they are. So it is one such creature that when I saw, he said, when you go to Sydney, you will be given a very important word to share to the nation. And this is the word. Now here is a warning. Many 
gay people and the gay community thinks that the gays will be allowed to go to heaven. 